The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. We are back talking ball, talking baseball in the zone. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. I'm joined today by two baseball mavens. One is Gabriel Schechter, Hall of Fame writer and the, as far as I know, the newest resident of Oregon. <laughs> the newest baseball resident, anyway. Okay, well, there could have been an update during the week. Um, other people might be moving. <laughs> um, and Gene, Gene, the Yankee-hating machine, um, in deference to the old gong show, um, show that uh, I loved watching when I was supposed to be working through life. <laughs> and uh, Gene is here. How are you, sir? I am fine. Good morning, Gene. Morning. Good morning. Good. Have you guys met? Uh, we haven't met, but we've exchanged books and uh, corresponded a bit. Beautiful. Beautiful. So, um, just the idea that you guys have written books, I'm so in awe. When I was a kid, a kid my uncle, um, my grandfather, would take me to the New York City Public Library, and there was this immense file under the Dewey Decimal System of <laughs> books that were, um, and it was explained to me, it was the Library of Congress, and to be in that was re revered when I, was, when I was a kid. Yeah. And, uh, w one of the nice things that I do is get to talk to a bunch of folks who are, uh, whose works are in that library, and I can't tell you how much I respect uh, all of you, but um, you, you guys in particular because uh, – you're here. How about that? <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> an honor to me. Um, so I thought today uh, we would talk about um, the Atlanta Braves and what some folks consider to be a dynasty, although they've they only won one World Series in that Bobby Cox dynasty. So. First thing I want to know is that uh, we'll start with Gene. Do you consider it to be a dynasty? Well, it's, uh, they were a dynasty of sorts. It's not like they won the World Series. Uh, I would consider them a dominant team, not a, uh, a dynasty type team. Uh, I would consider the Dodgers of the fifties a uh, National League dynasty, and you consider these a uh, NL. Uh, uh, and that's an East dynasty. Yeah. You can break it down, but not okay. an overall dynasty. All right. Uh, Gabriel, your hmm. thoughts on the word dynasty connected to the Yeah, we could, we could talk for an hour about how to define dynasty. Um, you know, I would, call, I would say the Braves had a dynasty. I would say they had a failed dynasty because they only won the one title. But I'm thinking of, of the longevity of their domination. Uh, you know, Bill James talked about peak value versus career value. And I think they didn't have the peak value, say, of the Oakland A's of the early 70s. But their domination lasted uh, 15 seasons. That's hard to match. So in that sense, uh, they were a dynasty. You know, just a flawed, just flawed. It was 10 years, and that was an amazing feat. It, it is. It's 15 years now that I think about it, and absolutely an amazing feat. Um, Bobby Cox, uh, sure, Hall of, sure Hall of Famer uh, when he comes up. Oh, he's already in. Oh, he's in. Oh, okay. Uh, really morning. Um, yeah, we uh, would and, somebody, yeah, I'd like to know what, what with that record. And as a matter of fact, Bobby Cox, 
Cubs. He was the GM through some of some of all of that. All right, and and John Schurholz is also uh, in. Uh, well deserving. Well deserving. Yeah. Yeah. I think his kid is playing ball. If I'm not mistaken, somewhere he got drafted. Maybe by the Mets. Um, let's talk about that great pitching staff without, uh, of Smoltz and, and um, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> Maddox. <laughs> and Maddox. Greg, uh, Greg Maddox. You know, one thing uh, I remembered from, from the time, Atlanta had those horrible teams in the 80s. Uh, but they they brought up Glavin and they they made the deal and got Smoltz and they put them in the majors when the team stank and they took their lumps and they learned to pitch so that by the time the the lineup was was bolstered and they had a good team they had already gotten their education out of the way and they were ready to shine. Uh, not every team would have done that, I don't think. Right, they stuck with them. And it was tough year. You're right. The pre-dynasty years with Jeff Burrows and um, the like, it was, it was tough. They were losing with good ball players, and uh, it, I think it was Cox that brought it all together. Yes. Okay. <laughs> What, uh, let's talk about the pitching coach of that Atlanta team. He sat there and rocked and <laughs> knew how to handle, knew how to handle them. He was, he, he, he was really the most valuable rocker on that team, you have to say. <laughs> MVR of that team. Yeah. Uh, they got John uh, Rocker. Yep. Leo, Leo Mazzone, he, I mean, he was sort of a throwback to, to uh, not quite to Johnny Singh, but he, he liked to have his pitchers throw, throwing between starts and throwing every day. Um, Smoltz broke down, but Maddox and Glavin never did. Right, and it took Smoltz a long time to break down. Yeah. Yeah. A Hall of Fame career, and just a side note: what a terrific commentator he is. He's about as natural as, as anyone. He brought out the best in Jack Buck in the playoffs. Uh, and for some, you may say, and that's tough to do. That's yeah, right. <laughs> Right, I was thinking along the same lines that he goes back into the Hall of Fame under the right, uh, under a different category, just for that. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, I enjoy what I call his company. You know, you bring an announcer in mm -hmm. into the living room and or a commentator, and you want to feel comfortable. You want to feel like it's conversation. Right. You like it not being talked down to, and he does that, and I really appreciate uh, appreciate how quickly he's um, come on and adjusted to role in life, and um, he doesn't seem to take himself too seriously. He doesn't yeah. have to get the la last word in. He can be a little whimsical, um, self-effacing uh, at that. Um, so he's well appreciated. Um, Gene, any thoughts about that um, that dynasty in quotes? Dyn quote dynasty end quote. Well, as uh, as who I am, I am naturally, and I refer to Bobby Cox as Booby Cox for that '96 World Series uh, moves. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you're talking about a former Yankee, so you hate him uh, right from the get-go. Gene's book is um, a very anti-Yankee. Bobby Cox came up as a Yankee just as they were going, <laughs> going south. So, um, oh, gosh. I remember as a teenager going to Yankee Stadium and my friend and I heckling him from the 
second deck, screaming, Cox sucks. <laughs> <laughs> that, those are good, good memories of the original Yankees. Ah, uh, good times, yeah. <laughs> Yes, when, yes. When he took, when he took was, Mike Malecki out in the 96 World Series after he was mowing him down and put Mark Wallers in for the only time in the eighth inning and later it's hit the three-run homer. I was screaming at the TV when he took Malecki out. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was a general tendency Cox had. He, he was one of the earlier ones to to uh, take his starters out after six innings and have a, a series of set-up guys when he had Mike Stanton and and a couple of others there, Leitenberg, that, that uh, were an early version of what bullpens are like now. And he cost them a lot of runs, a lot of wins. That, that crazy guys, I, guy at bullpen, was it Rocker? Who was, um, yeah. Listen, I did a... Uh, I did a I did a study of the, the times that starters came out with the lead and the bullpen subsequently blew the win. And Greg Maddox, uh, of all pitchers in the last 50 years, lost more wins. Um, 50, I think it's 58, something like that. Now he would have lost some of those leads himself, but that's how many games he he left where he would have gotten a win if the bullpen hadn't blown it. And a lot of that was Bobby Cox. Oh, uh, that's it. 58 games added to a 300 plus career. Um, yeah. That's very, very scary. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> like 400 wins. Uh, it, he should have had 400, yeah. From bullpen guy to bullpen guy, Throughout, they had a lot of flashes in the pan. Um, Wallers was about the best. I'd have to mm-hmm. say. Well, for three years, Smoltz was the best, really. I mean, Smoltz was uh, lights out as of those three years that he closed. Or that's right. That's basically what sealed the the Hall of Fame career for him. I I think. Yeah, I I agree. Tell me about uh, how it got. These guys were throwing so many pitches, and they were so successful. How it's gotten to an age where we coddle pitchers, or we they coddle pitchers more, and there seems to be more injuries. Is it a direct result of not having pitching enough, like pitching enough innings, pitching uh, between starts. Hmm. I think I think the main thing is that pitchers now are trained to throw all out, give everything they have for as long as they can or as little as they are asked to, and so they're putting more strain on on their arms. Their uh, managers are managing from the end of the game. To the to the beginning, a guy want, goes to the ballpark. He wants his closer to pitch the ninth. He wants this guy to pitch the eighth. That guy, three guys to get through the sixth and seventh, and every one of them is told just throw, put everything you have, because you're not going to be out there that long. You know what's weird? Air, athletes are are better across the board. As a species, we're getting more athletic, bigger, stronger, faster. Athletes are performing greater things in every sport except for starting pitchers in the major leagues. It can't be because they're inferior or less capable. It has to be with the way they're being trained and used. Right, or used up in the amateur uh, ranks. That's true, oh yeah. With all those traveling teams. Right, right. The high school coaches have a tendency to, and maybe even college coaches, um, we're only going to have a kid for so long, get as much out of him as you possibly can from that standpoint. And I think it's trying to live up to that scoreboard. You see it out there, 98 miles an hour. They want yeah. to make these fine. You know, so they're putting that, as you say, that necessary strain strain on their arm where they can be equally effective as pitchers 
if they could find an off-speed pitch. It's well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that was one of Greg Maddox's things. It's not velocity, it's variation in speed right. that throws batters off. And low Yep. And then the, Maddox was famous for getting the strike zone. By the end of the, the game, the strike mm -hmm. zone looked like a foot outside the Maddox. Because he can't get little by little, and um, he was yep, he and one of the glad in the same way. He was, yes, and um, they were crafty. I don't think we see that anymore. It's just rear back and throw, power, power, power. And I think baseball is away because the hitters uh, are responding just become a power game. Uh, and the faster the ball comes in, the faster the ball g goes out. So exactly. Uh, yeah, that's a for forgotten factor in the in the home run boom twenty years ago. That with the pitchers bigger and stronger, and throwing faster, the physics says the ball is going to go further. When they connect, and with the emphasis on just speed and not on that off-speed pitch, catching up with, with the pitch. I mean, these are major leaguers. You can throw it 100, you can throw it 100. Right. They know it's coming. They're, they're on it. So um, that's all part of how the game has changed. What got me this week, I'm reading the paper about the Mets, Callaway, the new manager, isn't planning on having the find closer. Now, maybe he's just trying to light a, a spark under Familia's butt a little bit. Probably, yeah. Uh, just to keep, a, you know, I don't know what motivates a guy who's... Well, he might start out believing believing that's what he's going to do, but if, if at the end of April some guy has reeled off four or five saves in a row... I think, well, I think that guy is going to be the closer. Uh, it, it's natural that uh, you would keep a good thing going if you were the man. Yeah. But he claims that he's going to go, at least for the time being, and as you say, if if he has some success with someone. Well, I think it's I think it's true that almost anybody can be a closer in the short term. Uh, the closers tend not to last long. Four or five seasons is about the, the limit of their their dominance. Um, and when one of these guys gets hurt or gets traded, some other guy comes in and does does a fine job because of the way the role is defined. Pitching only the ninth inning is not such a tough job as people as people think. I just flashed on James Yankees. And Goose Gossage coming in <laughs> after um, who did he take over for? Who had a great year? Spark was it Sparky Lyle? Lyle. Yeah, Ron Ron a, Davis. Ron Davis. Ah, okay, okay. And they brought Goose in, and um, after one year. That was the epitome of the Yankees and how they they worked and how the, the style. Oh yeah. Uh, yep. Right there. So uh, and it's interesting that some guys can pick up the mantle in the ninth inning and some guys just can't. Their careers set up. Both. Um, any examples of those that you guys can think of? Ralph, I didn't, I didn't quite catch that last part. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm just asking whether or not I, – I, I'm just noting that there are some pitchers that can have tr terrific careers as set-up men and for one reason or another can't do the job in the ninth inning historically. Is there anybody you can think of that um, has been successful that along those lines and just just didn't do well as a closer, either of you? Wow, that's a great question. 
Um, wow, nobody nobody jumps to mind. Okay. I mean, it seems like if they're that good, it, it, um, I know it's happened, but I can't think of any offhand, Ralph. You know, what brought to my mind the question, I was thinking Fernando Rodney has huh. had, uh, he was signed, it brought it to mind because he was signed this week by the Twins as a closer. And, right. Uh, I thought, why would they be going? They're, they're a young team. Um, coming out, why would they be going to him? And he's had stretches where he's done the job as a closer. But, yep. um, it, but a lot of times when um, it just didn't work out, he's been around for a while. So He's been around. I'm looking at his record. He's 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 been around 15 years, 300 career saves. But he's got a bad losing record, and his ERA isn't that good. Right, right. But he always seems to come up with the closest job. That um, well, I know he does. It's true. Yeah, and somewhere along the line, um, I'm just thinking from my fantasy baseball experience somewhere along the line you're going to be looking for another closer um, during the course of a year uh, anyway uh, what can we talk about that's interesting to you Gene that, um, one, of, one of the things about that Atlanta team I was, that I was looking at is that the pitching was one thing but it was, it was uh, a lot of their Offensive guys they brought along that that made a big difference. I mean, you can't underestimate what the arrival of uh, Chipper Jones did to that team. Oh yeah, uh, and Justice was Justice was very solid. Justice was was another one, but I mean the the the, the year they won the series was Chipper Jones' rookie year, and uh, Javi Lopez's first full season. Right. Does Chipper belong in the Hall of Fame, in, in your estimation? Oh, absolutely. Okay. He's a top five but third baseman. Oh, yeah. guy? Oh, yeah. He, they, I mean, he, he did it all for a long time. Right. Yeah, he was a great all-around player. The, the interesting guy, Andrew Jones, should have been a Hall of Famer. I think Andrew Jones is one of the prime examples of a guy with a lot of talent, who got enamored of steroids, and it bloated him. It built him up, so he hit 51 home runs one year. But ultimately, it aged and he aged him quickly and eroded his skills quickly. He only has a 254 batting average in, on base. So he, he fell off the – right after 30 years old, he fell off the table. He, yeah, he 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 had been developing as a hitter, and then he got home run happy, and and bulked up, and then he lost his mobility in the field. Yeah, steroids yeah. Are, are incredible. They will help you recover. They will uh, obviously add bulk and power and what have you. But they will, body also, they will tear your body apart because your lig ligaments and tendons. Already for the bulk, and you. Um... I, I lived in the Bay Area in the late '90s and watched uh, Barry Bonds play all those years. He lost. He literally lost the ability to bend over and pick up a, a ground ball base hit. Uh, his his physiology had changed, so he could not. He couldn't bend over. Right, um, but boy, it's it crazy. A five and six year period. I watched the oh. Giants out there too. Um, yep. Yeah, he was so locked in, and combined with the armor that he wore in his mm -hmm. right arm, where he could hang in and not be a part oh, yeah. of, of that inside pitch. Um, wow. I I, I, I think in those years he was probably the second coming of Ted Williams because 
From what I saw, he would not swing at a pitch outside the zone, and he crushed everything in the zone. His singles were hit hard. His outs were hit hard. And Go ahead. even he was a better defensive player by Williams, even with the weak arm on left field, he got the ball away quickly. Up uh huh. Compare the two. Say yes, he was uh, probably the better all around player. Now, the, the effects of steroids and all of that, you, you can debate it. But what you can't debate is that he was a Hall of Fame um, talent. Right? Be, he had the Hall of Fame numbers before he ever saw a needle. Yeah, and, and I mean that's the same argument that made in uh, Roger Clemens' favor, right. as as opposed to a guy like uh, Sosa or McGuire. Well, Sosa though was all uh, Sosa had nothing for steroids. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. Oh, you said Sosa and McGuire were going nowhere. Right. Exactly. Uh, although McGuire was what he was, he was a good, uh, probably respective power hitter coming up. He took to steroids quickly, though. Without well, he got hurt. A, he got hurt a lot, and I think that's when it happened. Yeah. There were all those years in the early '90s where he was hurt and didn't play much. Right, and a lot of that was because of uh, foot injuries and whatever. Mm-hmm. It, the ligaments couldn't hold the, the bulk. I mean, he was a mess. Yeah. <laughs> he was six five to begin with, and um, and I saw him at the desk when it, the year he came out of the Olympics. Wow, really? Um, wow. He was, I used to go watch him uh, take batting practice in Oakland. That was a quite a show he would put on there in BP. Okay. Oh man. Yeah. Canseco, you got, have to give, um, and one thing I admire about Canseco, he never lied. Everything he said about what was going on with steroids in his books and his, uh, in this, that, and the other thing, he he was never, never caught in a lie. I admire a guy like that more than I do a guy like Barry Bonds, whose head size went up, his cap size goes to to an eight plus from a seven and a half or whatever. Now, believe me. You mean his swelled head just wasn't just from ego? It was, maybe it was both. Then let's. Uh, I can concede that, but he had a reason to, to have a swell head if he if he did. This guy. Um, yeah. Displayed skills that we we didn't see since Mays, and, and you know the bottom the bottom line all through the steroid the, the the haze of that is that you still have to hit the ball. And whatever whatever you've done whatever you've done uh, you know away from the field doesn't matter. You still have to hit that ball, and nobody hit it like he did. And he's he was facing pitchers that were on steroids. Yep. That, that, that's something that, so maybe in a sense, yeah. able were more equal than, you, you know, than you would think because. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. And he was also, fa- you know, with the specialization, as you say, they could pitch as hard as they can for as, whatever time they're needed and bringing in five, six pitchers in two or three innings to replace the starter um, makes it a different ball game than what Ted Williams faced. Well, yeah, you know, when when, when we were growing up, a, a pitcher going nine innings and facing each guy four times, maybe five, he would pitch him different, and he would pitch him in the second inning to set him up for a key spot in the eighth or ninth. Pitchers today don't even conceive of that. They, they're going to see each guy tw- twice. They're going to pitchers in 
in just the same way. He he would maybe look yeah. in on pitch in the early innings, and yeah. and he know he'd get that pitch again because the pitcher said, "Well, I got him this time. Let me get him the next time," and he'd be ready. And um, I don't think all players strategize like they did. I don't think. No, they're not. They're not asked to go through the lineup twice because. Somebody's put numbers together the third time through the lineup, you get in trouble, and so go through the lineup twice, and we'll get the next guy in there, and you don't have to think about uh, strategy. You just throw. Then there's the shift. One of his <laughs> guys, Gene Hutmaker, on the shift. I incorporated that back in the 1980s a couple of times when I was doing uh Within my uh, when I was coaching in the uh, youth leagues a couple times, so I was just surprised okay. that they didn't do it earlier. I, like since Lou Bedreau had such good success with it back in uh, '48. Right, right. Lou Bedreau was I think, correct about that. All right. Breaking up, Ralph. Uh, this time, so time Comcast is push, push up pox on their, their entire family. What can I say? Is this better? Uh, not yet. <laughs> okay. Now you're good. All right, let's keep it here. How about that? <laughs> um, Gene, tell me more about the shift. Well, when I was pitching and I had a, uh, a slow pitcher, I would move my second baseman. So I'd have three guys on the left side of uh, the infield. Because I know he wasn't going to hit it to the right side. Right. So, that I mean, makes I sense, think doesn't it? It really hurts the uh, batting averages right now in the majors, which is you guys sitting uh, line shots into short right field and getting thrown out of first base. Right. Well, that's because they, they're not giving in to um, – they're not playing little ball anymore. They're not the non-power hitters in the game from a pay scale, and it's all about agents encouraging players. And you know, with the numbers. I think it's up, the faster, the faster pitches, but miles per hour, because it's harder to control a uh, 95 mile an hour pitch compared to the 50s and 60s, the 88 mile per hour pitch. So it's a little bit harder to have the back control that you had back in the 60s and 70s. Well, that's true. Um, well, you think you, you you wouldn't need to have that kind of back control if they're giving you the whole left side of the infield. Now, Tony Gwynn would eat it up. Uh, now, by the way, I, I, I had to look up Tony Gwynn's stats for somebody, and here's we're talking about the Braves. Gwynn had 249 at bats against Maddox, Glavin, and Smoltz. He had 394 against them. And in all those at bats, he struck out three times. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, that's astonishing, isn't it? Maddox never struck him out. Smoltz got him once. Him, him and Rod Carew probably had two of the best uh, controlled bats. Absolutely. When Absolutely. And, and Ichiro. Ichiro, I think, is in the same boat. It was Ellie Fox, if you remember. Yep. Um, who, who would do that? Luke Appling, I remember hearing about. I was too young to have seen him. Um, would foul off a monumental amount of pitches. I'm just uh, waiting for his pitch. Richie Ashburn. Appling was an artist. Richie Ashburn was another guy, another foul ball expert. I wrote an article about this. Paul Weiner was another one. Um, Eddie Stanky was another one. They would just drive the pitchers nuts. Wow. You know, the first game I went to, it's funny, the first game I went to as a kid was... New York Giants against the Phillies at the um, grounds. Eddie Stanky was playing second, and Richie Yesburn was the first batter I ever saw bat. He 
he came up nice. with Jim Hurt was the pitcher. I, May of 51, something. I haven't looked that up in, in that retro. Hmm. Thing. Uh, probably, probably not in the box school. Um, but it's funny that you mentioned those two in the same um, in the same sentence. Baseball's fun to talk about, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the, is, it's just great. Brings up memories. I enjoyed this, gentlemen. If um, you'll come back and keep coming back, Gabriel, I, Gene has fallen, fallen into the habit. Um, Sunday mornings, I'll, I'll come up with a topic that will try to keep your interest. And um, I'd appreciate, I appreciate your company just like... Hey, Ralph. Ralph. Yes, sir. Ralph, excuse me. May 12th, 1951. That's your game. That's your game. Jim Hearn against the Phillies. Uh, well, Phillies won six to five in ten innings. That, there you go. That, that, that set the tone for a lifetime right there. Yep. Robin Roberts started, Roberts started, went four innings. Jim Constanti pitched five innings to pick up the win. Uh, they, Beautiful. They were people, Granny Hamner. And um, <laughs> was was in there, and there was um, Del there. Ennis. Yep. Del Ennis, and right, wow. These Eddie guys, Wakeless. Off, they were world champions. They were defending National League champions. Yeah. National League champions. Yes, defending National League champions. Okay, I just wanted to sneak that in, Ralph. I appreciate that, and um, wow. Thank you, sir. Uh, <laughs> ask your computer. Gene, um, always appreciated. You want to tell Thank us you. about your book for the holidays? Maybe uh, both of you plug what you got because the holidays are coming up, and you never know. Start with you, Gene. Where can, where can we reach, the, reach you and or your book? Okay, anyone who wants to contact me, I am at Gene Hutt at hotmail.com. Finally in my life, I became a hotmail. Also, it's <laughs> amazon.com and uh, five-star reviews. And with a uh, Yankee hating at an all-time high, it would be a great Christmas gift for anyone. Band in the Bronx, the Yankee hater memoirs, 1953-2005. Gabriel, now that I've learned to spell your name for the most part, <laughs> Well, see, I, I haven't seen the proof of it, but I'm glad you think so. <laughs> I, well, or at least when you call it out to me, I change it to what it should be. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, right? Uh, I'm responsible. Yep. If, if not a stupid mother. Um, <laughs> I've, got, I've, got, I've got three books. Uh, you can find them at charlesaprilcom Okay. Biography of Victory Faust, the book about uh, pitching, and also an anti-Yankees book. But we'll talk about that some other time. Whoa, whoa. You both, you both can talk about your, your hatred, your equal hatred. And Maybe we should do that sometime, huh, Gene? <laughs> yeah, that would be, that would be uh, really good. Absolutely. <laughs> and um, let me say this, that when I was a kid, I joined you guys in hating the Yankees. It's just that now that the memories of – because my Giants had moved, it was before the Mets, I lived at Yankee Stadium and loved the players but hated the team, worshipped mm -hmm. the players. I thought that Bobby Richardson, Cleet Boyer, Tony Kubek, and Joe Pepitone were the greatest infield of our time. I – there was no question defensively uh, Cleet Boyer was off the hook, and Richardson mm -hmm. was too. Kubek was solid. Pepitone was a terrific defensive first baseman. And yet I, I had that, um, that thing. I couldn't root for the team because it was like rooting for U.S. Steel. 
That's, That's what my father used to say. Right. That was, is it, or yeah, or the General Motors, yeah. maybe General Motors, yeah. General Motors, yeah, whatever. Um, and then they went out and got a guy like Bud Daly, who was the best pitcher on Kansas City. Who uh-huh, was, Bud Daly. They were a farm team at the time, the Yankees, major league yeah. farm team. And it would piss us off as kids because we saw that the tables weren't balanced. And um, to this day, that's what bugs me the most about sports is that there's not a level playing field for the most part. And a quick story on that, uh, Ralph. Uh, Jeff Katz, the mayor of Cooperstown, wrote a great book about that called The Other the wrong side of the Yankees or something like that. Um, he got a great quote from uh, Ryan Doran. When Roger Maris was traded from the Indians to Kansas City, I think in 1958, the reaction in the Yankees clubhouse was, hey, we just got Roger Maris. Now they have Marlin. But... Um, it's sad. It's like one of those things. It's funny, <laughs> but not funny. Ha ha. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. That we. That not how to have the Marlins. They knew it was a matter players. of time. That puts it really puts it in focus, doesn't it, Gene? Yeah. How how crass it was. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, that's what Hank Greenberg said when he was the general manager of the Indians. It's easier to win when you have your farm team in the league. <laughs> about the yep. Yankees, right? Right. Okay, guys, thank you very much. This was fun, and we will do it again real soon on the topic of hating the Yankees. Okay, okay Ralph. Okay. All right. Have a good one. See you soon, guys. Okay. And if you're listening out there and you enjoyed this, do me a solid. Accumulate some lightly used children's books and take them down to the Head Start program wherever you live. It's a good thing to get kids ready for school, get them reading, get them interested. And um, if you didn't like the offering, go down to Head Start, steal the books, bring them home, <laughs> and have them <laughs> Uh, if I can make, make Gabriel laugh, my morning is complete. Thank you, sir. You, you got it, Ralph. <laughs> All right. See you next week. Adios. Okay. Adios.